Hi, everybody. Hello. We still need two for quorum. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. And we just have the public defender's office presenting today, right? Sending a courtesy email out right now, just to see if that helps. I see DA Becton and Cheryl just hopped on. Does that put us at quorum? Yes. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our um, our job diversion committee meeting. We're going to start off with introductions. Um, and if we could just go down our list, please, Nicole. Yep, yeah. Kira. I'm sure we're having some trouble with audio. If you can't um, get your audio to work, you can introduce yourself in chat, Kira. Ellen? Or Robin, did you want to introduce Ellen? Sure, yeah. So I'm Robin. I look at these pictures. It is white, but I thought that was a. Are we good? I'm Robin. You guys all know me. Um, this will be my last meeting, and Ellen will be filling in in my place um, on this subcommittee and on the RJOG um, committee um, body, I should say. So I think um, most of you already know Ellen, but anyway, I'll turn it over to Ellen and she can introduce herself. Good afternoon, Ellen McDonald, uh, Public Defender's Office. I'm really uh, excited to join you all in this subcommittee and on the larger our job body. Welcome, Ellen. Dinah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dinah Beckton, District Attorney. Happy to see everyone. Cheryl. All set it. All set it. And, uh, oh, I'm going to miss you. And, uh, Stephanie, I'm assuming you, you introduced yourself, correct? No, I want to say happy birthday. I'm Stephanie from the Rise Center. Yeah. I still want to say happy birthday to DA Becton, too. Oh, happy birthday. Sneak it in. <laughs> Thank you all. Do you want to do introductions with the community or would you like them to introduce themselves in chat? Sure, if we could have community introduce yourselves in chat, that would be great. We got through all of the members? Yep, Stephanie, oh, wow. Cheryl, Diana, Diana, and Ellen and Kira. Yep, right. Lisa is not here, Tanisha and Michael are, are not here. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. And if you didn't hear me for community folks, if you could please, um, just introduce yourself in the chat. That would be great. Um, okay. and Before we do that, can I just introduce my two staff members who are going to be presenting today? Because sure. um, I don't know that they would consider themselves community guests at this point. But anyway, we've got Brandon Banks, who's going to talk about uh, military diversion, and Christy Pierce, who's going to talk about mental health diversion. Great. Thank you. Welcome, you all. Um, all right, and so do we have any announcements from committee members?
Okay, see, now we're gonna move on. Next, we have public comments. So we'll open it up for the public. If you have anything that you would like to say right now um, that is not already on our agenda, please, you are welcome to do so right now. And seeing none, we're gonna keep it moving. Um, next on our agenda is the approval of our record of action from June 17. Um, and hopefully everybody has had a chance to take a look at it. And if there are any edits or additions that need to be added to that, please say so now from the committee. And before I call for a motion, are there any um, comments from the public on this particular item? Okay, so I will open it up for a motion to approve our minutes, our record of action, excuse me. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Robin. Motion. And I will second. Thank you, Cheryl. And we'll do a roll call vote. Kira? She said I. Yeah, I see that. Um, I'm sorry, is it Ellen or Robin or, that will be voting in this meeting? I think it's still me. Okay. I. Dinah? Dinah Beckton? Come back to her, Cheryl? Yes, ma'am. Stephanie. Yes. Let's try one more time, Diana Beckton. Motion carries. Thank you. And just FYI, um, I'm having some internet issues. So if I happen to fall off, just be aware that I'm, I'll try to get back on as soon as possible. All right, so um, next on our agenda, we have presentations on um, our adult diversion programs. And as many of you remember, we've had presentations on the youth programs. And so we were waiting to have our presentations for the adult program. So I'm super excited to have um, the Public Defender's Office presenting on the Veterans Diversion Program as well as the Mental Health Diversion Program. And at this time, I will turn it over to um, Brandon. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon Banks. I'm an assistant public defender here at the Contra Costa County Public Defender's Office. Uh, and one of my roles is uh, my involvement in the uh, Veterans Treatment Court. And so today I'm gonna be talking to all of you about um, veteran diversion. So before I start with veteran diversion, I wanna back up a little bit and first talk about Penal Code Section 1170.91. Uh, this became operative in 2015. And this Penal Code Section requires the court to consider a person's military background um, before they, that person is sentenced because there was a recogni recognition by the legislature that the military service can have a traumatic impact on a person's life and impact their decision-making. And this particular penal code section that was passed in 2015, uh, put an emphasis on the courts and judges to consider someone's military service and the trauma they might've suffered while they served in the military as a mitigating circumstance before um, that person is sentenced uh, on a conviction. And the reason I bring that up um, before talking about military diversion, is because that really is the foundation for uh, military diversion. Uh, military diversion under Penal Code Section 1001.80 uh, is an evolution of this concept that 1170.91 uh, uh, established. Uh, the legislature again recognized 
that the courts should not only consider a person's military service prior to sentencing, but that in certain circumstances, specifically misdemeanors, they should consider deferring prosecution against that person uh, if there is a connection between uh, trauma that they suffered from during their military experience and the incident that they were arrested for. Uh, military diversion, uh, I should note, is only available for misdemeanor offenses, unfortunately not for felony offenses. I should also note that uh, it shouldn't be confused with Veterans Treatment Court, uh, which is a separate program. Uh, but uh, in Contra Costa County, Judge Brady, who runs Veterans Treatment Court, uh, also handles the military diversion cases. So the military diversion in Contra Costa County is overseen by Judge Brady, who also handles Veterans Treatment Court. Uh, as far as the technical details are concerned for military diversion, um, it is a uh, form of what's called pretrial diversion. And it's authorized as uh, I just noted by Penal Code Section 1001.80. And this section allows the judge to postpone criminal proceedings for misdemeanor uh, offenses or alleged offenses while the person obtains treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, which we commonly know as PTSD, uh, sexual trauma that they might have suffered in the military, traumatic brain injury, uh, substance use disorder, or mental health issues. And upon completion of uh, the military diversion program, the charges are dismissed, uh, and they are dismissed completely as if the person had never uh, had never suffered uh, a filing of the charge, and the arrest also will have never been deemed to have occurred as a result of successful completion of diversion. Uh, once that person successfully completes diversion, uh, the individual can also have their arrest sealed. The diversion timeline uh, in our county is, uh, the military diversion timeline is 18 months. So once someone uh, starts the diversion process uh, at, on day one, they have 18 months to complete diversion. And at the end of that 18 month period, that's when uh, the case will be dismissed. So the next question is who is eligible for military diversion? And there is what I, what I like to call a three pronged analysis. The first prong is uh, the person has to be uh, either currently in the military or previously served in the military. And the way that we establish this generally is by getting a copy of the person's DD-214. Uh, that is a one page document that outlines the person's military service and the history of their service. And it has really important information to establish that the person in fact served in one of the military branches. So that's the first prong. The next prong for consideration uh, under military diversion is as a result of that person's military service, um, are they suffering from one of the conditions I just mentioned? Again, post-traumatic stress disorder, sexual trauma, traumatic brain injury, uh, substance use disorder, or a, another mental health issue. And the third prong is whether there's a nexus or a relationship between their military service, the trauma that they suffered, and the alleged offense. So once we establish those three prongs uh, as an advocate for the person that we are trying to get into diversion, the person will normally be accepted into the, the, into the diversion program. Uh, so one of the things that we have to do is establish one of those issues. For example, uh, PTSD or TBI or a mental health issue. Oftentimes, a very good way that we um, can establish that is by looking at the person's, not only their military records, but perhaps their doctor's records that they might have at the VA. Often those records will establish that the person was diagnosed with PTSD or TBI uh, or even substance, uh, substance use disorder or sexual trauma. But that's not the only way we can establish those things. Uh, oftentimes these uh, issues are self-reported uh, by the client and we can go into detail with that client, get their life history, including their, uh, what trauma they suffered in the military 
and use that as a way to establish the nexus or the relationship between their military service and the charge that they're facing. And so in practice, uh, we've been given wide latitude um, by the court to establish this link and it's worked out quite well for many of our clients. Uh, I will say though, that with respect to the uh, military diversion, the judge also has wide latitude and significant discretion in deciding whether to accept someone into the military diversion program. Uh, we've advocated many times to get people who are charged with misdemeanors into the military diversion program. And more often than not, we've been very successful uh, in making that happen. That's not always the case. Sometimes uh, Judge Brady will um, decide based on the facts of the case, based on uh, the person's history, that they are, are not a good candidate for the diversion program. Uh, but more often than not, we have been pretty successful in getting those individuals into the military diversion program. Once that person is accepted into the diversion program, uh, the requirements for completion of the program are pretty straightforward. So if you're engaged in um, some form of treatment already before you go into the program, there will be a requirement that you maintain that treatment. Uh, if you have uh, services through the VA and you're connected to the VA, there will be a requirement to maintain those services and not to leave those services. Uh, and then the final requirement is not to have any significant law enforcement contact like an arrest or suffer any sort of conviction during the 18 month period. If uh, an individual can complete all of that successfully, at the end of the 18 month period, the case is dismissed. And again, that's a complete dismissal. Uh, it uh, will show up as being completely dismissed uh, on the person's rap sheet. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, the person can have their arrest sealed. Uh, so this has a really positive impact. The, diver the military diversion program has a really positive impact on our clients that come into the program because clients that might be charged with a DUI, uh, as you might know, DUIs uh, can have a lasting impact uh, on a person's life. It carries significant fines and fees. Uh, they are priorable, meaning that they can be used against that person if the person picks up another a DUI case. And the opportunity to have a case like that dismissed uh, after successful completion of diversion has a really, really uh, positive impact on that person's life. And I did mention earlier that uh, diversion is distinct from Veterans Treatment Court, uh, but uh, sometimes when the judge is determining, when Judge Brady is determining whether or not someone is eligible for diversion, she will provide an avenue into veterans treatment court rather than diversion to give that person an opportunity to receive treatment that way. Um, so that's uh, my presentation on military diversion. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, um, Brandon. And actually Patrice asked a question I was getting ready to ask. Um, and we'll go ahead and open it up to our committee members first. But um, does dishonorable discharge from the military disqualify somebody from participating in the program? The short answer is no. Uh, and in fact, sometimes uh, without getting too far into the weeds, um, there are various ways that a person can be discharged from the mil military. That's not necessarily, be, not necessarily an honorable discharge. And sometimes when someone is dishonorably discharged from the military, that might actually be the nexus between their military service and the offense. So if they uh, suffered from a substance use disorder while in the military and that resulted in the dishonorable discharge uh, and let's say they pick up a, a DUI because of an ongoing substance use disorder, uh, that would actually be the, the link that we use to get them into the diversion program. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? I have a question. Um, do you, can you talk about the numbers generally of um, clients maybe in a given month who qualify for this? Yes, so that's, uh, so Veterans Treatment Court is, is once a month and uh, on uh, the way the referral process works in uh, 
in Contra Costa County is uh, once a client is identified, a misdemeanor client is identified as being a veteran and as being a likely candidate for uh, military diversion, the misdemeanor attorney will notify me and send me the file. And so once a month we address potential clients who might be eligible for um, military diversion. And on average, it's one to two uh, misdemeanor clients that are considered for military diversion. Brandon, is there a potential for this to expand to maybe um, higher level felonies or some that might be wobblers? So the way that the penal code is written now, it's limited to misdemeanors. Uh, I would love for the legislature to expand the criteria uh, because I think that there are a wide variety of felonies that uh, where cl clients who are charged with felonies could really benefit from uh, diversion rather than the traditional prosecution. But uh, currently uh, it's limited, the penal code section limits it to uh, misdemeanor charges. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? If not, I'll open it up to the public for any comments or questions. So we have another comment. Patrice, did you want to come off mute and ask your question or? Sure, I'm a little under the weather, so forgive me for sounding uh -huh. kind of icky. Um, but my question was, uh, you just mentioned, Brandon, that um, you know, due to the statute, um, it's limited to, to misdemeanors. So I'm wondering if our local court system uh, have the ability or have any discretion um, to go beyond that. No, unfortunately not. So that the court is going to be restricted by the statute and they have the court of the judge has to comply with the limitations um, that are set out in the statute. So even if the judge wanted to offer someone military diversion who was charged with a felony, the judge would be precluded from doing that because they're not allowed the discretion to expand the criteria. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I had two quick questions. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry, but could you uh, uh, repeat the, uh, the the numbers uh, per month uh, one more time? Sure. It's uh, we average about one to two misdemeanor clients who are referred um, for uh, military diversion consideration, which is just to be clear, separate from clients who are referred for the kind of traditional veterans treatment court program. Gotcha. That, that's what I wrote down. I just wanted to make sure that I had it, had it right. Um, and um, so you talked about uh, one of the requirements being that, uh, uh, you know, that, that attendees of the program uh, maintain pre-existing treatment, but I'm curious if there's any sort of substantial uh, referrals or you know, resources available to them if they haven't already started treatment at the time that uh, they, they begin the diversion program? So for, uh, really good question, for military veterans, uh, what we have found in practice is that a lot of them come into the criminal court system uh, with a pretty robust connection to the VA and the VA actually does a really good job of providing a wide variety of services uh, to, the, um, to the veteran clients that we serve. And they often uh, come into military diversion or the Veterans Treatment Corps program with these services in place, which often allows them to complete the um, diversion program um, without uh, any barriers or hiccups. Right. Doesn't look like we have any more questions. Thank you so much, Brandon. Oh, yeah, thank you. Cheryl, I see a hand. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Brandon. 
great presentation, but I do uh, just thinking about uh, Christopher's last question. I guess um, I, I, I and I want to. I mean, full disclosure, I come from a military family, so I guess I'm. I guess I'm. I, uh, my question would be the same. What if they don't come with it with those services? Because I question uh, the presumption that the veteran comes with those services because many times they don't have those services already being provided. I know the presumption is that they do. Sometimes they do not. And I will tell you full disclosure that I spent 13 years working um, with DOJ with a program in the Ability One program with wounded warriors and veterans with significant disabilities. And they don't always have these services that are provided to them, or not that they're not offered, but they don't always recognize that themselves as people with significant disabilities because they associate themselves as veterans, as an identity, right? Their military career is an actual identity for them. To, so to say, to have to accept uh, mental health services or physical disability services is a huge, um, is a huge step for many wounded warriors and, and, and veterans with, with disabilities. So I will say to you that the presumption that they have these services, um, that they're coming with these services into the system uh, may be an error. So to Christopher's point, what is the, what is the step to, to fill that gap if they don't have these services already? Is there, is there something that fills that gap to make sure that they're getting these services if they don't already have them? rather than saying um, they must continue, is there something that says they will get services? Do so that's a, question? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, we don't necessarily presume that they come with services um, that are already in place through the VA, for example, but oftentimes we're able to confirm that they have services in place prior to the person going in to the diversion program. If, the per if it so happens that the person does not have services in place, then uh, again, part of our holistic approach as uh, um, the Public Defender's Office is that we can connect them with other community-based um, services if they don't already have those in place. And I will say that in practice, as an advocate for these people that we're trying to get into the diversion program, um, we certainly don't wanna create uh, additional requirements for them or put in place more barriers um, for those people to successfully complete the diversion program. And so the way that we kind of navigate that particular issue is um, the judge will just say on the record, if you have services in place, make sure you maintain those services. Uh, and we have opportunities for you to uh, get connected to other services. But practically, uh, we are not, if they don't have services in place uh, or if they leave those services, uh, that's often not a barrier to successful completion of the program. And so part of what we wanna do is balance getting services in place for the client, but not creating additional uh, requirements for them um, to complete the program. Thank you. I think this is what we wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Sure. I appreciate that response. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, thank you so much, Brendan, for sharing about the program. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. So we'll move on to our next um, topic, which is, and I lost my agenda. Um, the Mental Health Diversion Program, and Christy Pierce is presenting on that. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, so Mental Health Diversion is a newer diversion, newer than uh, military. Um, it was first passed in June of 2018 um, as Assembly Bill 1810. 
And originally it had no exclusions um, and it didn't have, there were a couple things that the legislature then cleaned up. So by January 1st, 2019, we got the current version that we have now um, that's been operating. A little history with it. Um, part of the idea for mental health diversion was to help divert some of the clients who are on the list to go to the Department of State Hospitals for competency training. So um, just forgive me if I'm saying things everyone knows, but just a little snippet of that is, you know, if a person comes into the criminal justice system and they are not competent, um, they can't go forward to trial until they become competent. Um, and one of the ways that happens is the court um, will very often order someone to a stay at the Department of State Hospitals. Um, so Napa State Hospital, Atascadero. Um, and the wait list is quite long. And so there are a lot of folks just sitting in the local jails waiting. And so part of this diversion statute was to take um, some of those folks and offer them community services in their county um, in the hopes that that um, gives them the services they need to function and um, function long term. And then if they successfully complete their case um, similar to military diversion is dismissed and the records upon which the arrest occurred are um, deemed never to have occurred. So there is a nice boon there at the end um, for people who are successful. Um, and so the criteria for how you get mental health diversion, um, there are a couple factors, but the most important ones are um, you have to have a, a mental disorder diagnosis as listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, this has been interpreted differently by different judges. We are on our third judge now. Um, so some judges have been willing to take um, diagnoses such as alcohol use disorder um, or methamphetamine use disorder. Um, the current judge, Judge Brady, has been a little bit more reluctant to do that. So the cases that she's taking are more along the lines of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Um, we've also had clients with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depressive disorder, but under the statute, any um, DSM uh mental disorder qualifies and we are definitely filing those um, the second factor is that the symptoms of the mental illness have to have been a significant factor in the elements of the offense that the person is charged with so um, one example would be somebody's hearing voices and they um, go into a house because the voices are telling them that they own the house and that they're allowed to live there, something like that. Um, but it can be a little bit looser than that. Um, and the court has not been, um, the court has been more flexible on that, that factor when all the other um, criteria are in place. Um, the third one is that the behaviors that contributed to the arrest would respond to treatment. Um, this has been fairly easy to establish and hasn't been a point of much contention because most of the diagnoses, um, there's pretty understood um, treatment models that do work. Um, and then Another, the, the last criteria that becomes um, something that um, a case can turn on is whether or not the person presents an unreasonable risk of danger to the public. And this has been handled differently, again, by different judges. Um, under the code section, it indicates that there shouldn't be a risk that the person would commit a super strike 
um, which is a very like discrete class of criminal code sections. Um, the current judge, again, has been a little bit more conservative on this. So if somebody has, um, you know, too many arrests over their lifetime and, you know, they are, you know, many felonies, she often will determine that they're too much of a risk to the public. Um, there are some excluded charges, but they are few and far between. Um, there are things like homicide, weapons of mass destruct, ah. <laughs> weapons of mass destruction. Don't know why I can't say that. Um, and you know, quite a few of the um, sexual offenses. Um, but felonies are included. So unlike military diversion, you can have felony charges and um, get mental health diversion. And in fact, one of my first cases was someone who was not able to get military diversion. He was um, a military veteran from, um, from, he was in special ops and he had PTSD. And we were actually able to get him mental health diversion with the PTSD diagnosis, um, even though he wasn't eligible for military. Um, let's see, the time period for diversion is up to two years. And I would say that the court has really been holding people to that two years. Um, we had hoped for at least some of the misdemeanor cases, it would be shorter and a few have been, but it's been close to two years for most of the cases. Um, and then the treatment plan. So the treatment plan has been an issue. The statute didn't um, mandate that anyone provide treatment. So in our county, we have gotten a grant from the Department of State Hospitals and Forensic Mental Health um, got part of that grant money, money to provide services. Um, but they don't necessarily take everyone. And um, we have clients who have private health insurance like Kaiser um, or live out of county and forensic mental health um, for the most part will only treat people that have Contra Costa County Medi-Cal. Um, so, if the court decides that somebody meets the eligibility and suitability requirements, then we refer them to forensic mental health to create a treatment plan. Um, or if forensic mental health says they're not eligible, then our in-house um, social worker that we have um, will work with community service organizations to try to create a treatment plan to present to the court. Um, once we get the treatment plan, there's often a back and forth, a couple court dates before the judge um, will say yes. Um, sometimes she'll ask to add things or the district attorney who appears will object to certain things. Um, it is supposed to be specifically tailored to a person's needs. Um, I will say the majority of clients have to do some sort of therapy, have to do medication management, meet with a psychiatrist, um, any alcohol and other drug services, if they're applicable, uh, vocational services, GED, um, that sort of thing. And the, the folks that are getting services through forensic mental health um, tend to meet with them once a week. We also have clients who are getting services through the assisted outpatient treatment program in Contra Costa. Um, and that's been great because that program pre-existed, so it was pretty seamless. And then, you know, we are working with various community providers. Um, sort of an example case, I was thinking of, you know, just to get an idea of how this is functioning in the real world. Um, one of my clients was 22 years old at the time of arrest. He is diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was off his medications. He went into a bank and went up to the bank teller 
and was sort of mumbling and she wasn't sure what he was saying. And then he allegedly said he maybe he was there to rob the bank. And so she gave him some cash and he held onto the cash and you could see this in the video and he just looked around and he stood there for a long time and he was kind of talking to himself and then he put the cash back down and he went outside the bank and he sat on the steps outside the bank and when the police arrived he was sitting on the steps outside the bank and the officer saw him and said wait didn't we do a welfare check with you earlier today and he said yes and then you know they arrested him for bank robbery um and he had been off his medication and you know really just uh symptomatic and so he was placed on mental health diversion and referred to forensic mental health and has a treatment plan in place. Um, we have court every Monday. Clients come 30 days after they're granted mental health diversion. And then if they're doing well, they come back um, quarterly. However, the court gets an updated progress report every month. So, um, and if clients are doing well, they don't have to come to court. Um, we have maintained Zoom court, um, which has actually been really helpful for the mental health clients because not everyone has transportation. Um, court can be very stressful for a lot of the mental health clients. And so appearing by Zoom is a little bit less stressful um, and that's worked well. In terms of numbers, so our first client in Contra Costa was placed on mental health diversion in February 2019, and he successfully completed it this past February. Um, we have had 14 successful completions so far. We have 27 currently active clients on mental health diversion. and. Um, let's see, I was looking at my numbers. I have 16 in the works that I am potentially, you know, looking at filing petitions or have petitions written, just haven't filed them. Um, and we've had, as far as petitions, people who did not get mental health diversion, I've had 23 petitions that I have filed where the judge denied mental health diversion. So that's sort of the the general outline if anyone has any questions thank you christy we'll open it up to our committee for any questions sure thank you thank you for the presentation Ms. christy can you tell us again what are some of the reasons why the judge will deny the mental health, health division? And what, what, what does that number look like with the denials versus the acceptance? What is like percentage? If you have to give me a home run record, what, what would batten? <laughs> sure. So um, I'd have to do a little math to give you the total, but um, we've had, I've had 23 petitions that I filed that were denied. Um, and like I said, I have 27 current, and then I've had 14 successfully um, completed diversion. So that's 43 that have been granted and 23 that have been denied. Um, and the reasons that they're denied are often because the court states that they are too dangerous um, or that the court feels that they are too big of a risk to public safety. Um, that is probably the predominant reason that a, a petition is denied. We've had a couple where we had to withdraw them and that's not included in the 23 number where we couldn't find a service provider for them. Um, so forensic mental health was um, 
either it was before forensic mental health started taking the cases or they didn't qualify for forensic mental health services and we could not find an outside provider um, that was able to take um, to to provide the level of services that the court wanted. Is there like some rubric or some definition that helps us understand what um, too dangerous means? So the statute defines it, I think, pretty um, well. It says that the court is satisfied that the defendant will not pose an unreasonable risk of danger to public safety as defined in section 1170.18 if treated in the community. 1170.18, it's penal code section also refers to another penal code section, but essentially it's what we classify as a super strike. Um, they're the violent felonies. So the judge is essentially saying that she thinks there is a risk that the client would commit a super strike if they were placed on mental health diversion. Um, I often disagree. <laughs> Um, but there, ultimately, it is the judge who makes the decision. Okay. I, I guess, yes. Um, but this is called the racial justice oversight body. And I just see many times where just being in a certain skin tone can be perceived as dangerous. So I'll leave it at that. I'm just wondering how these how these judges are making these certain decisions when we've seen certain people released and that make even more dangerous. I think that's a really good point. And I think one of the problems is that the court currently will often look at a person's uh, arrest record to make this determination. And I think that that is very skewed. Um, so. Yeah I, yeah, I agree with you, but we have police officers killing people and we don't look at their arrest records, do we? I'm just saying. Totally. And I feel like the whole point of this statute is to take people who are continually cycling in and out of either psych emergency or police custody because of their mental illness and to I, instead provide them with services to try to break that cycle. Yes. And so, yes, many of the people who are in this cycle have had lots of arrests. Right. Um, and that to me is just a function of their symptoms of their mental illness and our broken mental health system and yes. not a function of their dangerousness, but. Exactly. And I don't I guess that's what I was asking. <laughs> no, and I guess that's what I was asking about the definition of dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Stephanie. You are very welcome. Thank you for your question. Um, and if there are no questions from the committee, I also think that question hit on Jill's question that she asked in the chat. If we don't have any more questions from the committee, I'll go ahead and open it up to the public. And Colleen, did you want to come off mute and answer, ask your question? Okay, thank you. I'm wondering if services could be provided to somebody while they are incarcerated. If they're considered too much of a risk, can you help to expedite their leaving prison? So um, technically, so no, the short answer is no. However, so when the judge makes the determination about whether or not someone qualifies, she is doing that with the understanding that they will be released um, because there is no service provider that can go into the jail and provide the services necessarily. However, I've had maybe two or three cases where 
the client was getting readjusted on a new medication regimen and forensic mental health said, yes, we think this person qualifies and is a good candidate, but we are asking that they stay in custody for two weeks um, while they adjust to the new medications that jail mental health has prescribed them. Um, so that would be sort of the rare instance. Um, there are also, I would say it's pretty frequent where clients have co-occurring um, drug and alcohol uh, dependence issues. And so in those treatment plans, they get released to a residential treatment program. And so they often have to wait in custody until there's a bed in a treatment program, which can be, you know, a week to two weeks, depending. COVID really threw a monkey wrench into a lot of it. Um, and so in those instances, for a very pre brief period of time, the client will remain in custody while they're on diversion. Um, but otherwise, no, it's they can't be um, diverted and maintained in a locked facility. Thank you. Um, I had a I had a couple of questions. So one I would ask um, if you have a sense of um, especially in, in terms of, uh, say, the, the folks that have been withdrawn for lack of sort of adequate services um, of, available to them, if you have a sense of what's missing in the community um, in terms of what sorts of mental health resources and supports uh, maybe we should be looking to try to develop uh, to sort of close some of those gaps. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest problems I see is um, folks who have their Medi-Cal or their last known address in, an out of, in a different county. So either Alameda County or Solano County or Stanislaus County, San Joaquin, you know, any of our neighboring counties, that becomes difficult because it's difficult for us to get them services in a different county and our county providers won't, for the most part, provide the services. So that's been a struggle. Um, also Kaiser. So, you know, we have a lot of really young clients in particular, you know, 18 to 24 who are still on their parents' um, health insurance which is great for a lot of reasons, but for mental health services, it's actually not great. Um, and so Kaiser has been a big struggle um, trying to get through that. And I think you're a service provider, Mr. James, so, right? So that's something you may have seen. Me as a, me personally? Oh, well, I, was, I had thought that you had come from a, a service provider when I saw your login. At any rate, Kaiser has been um, a real struggle. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, that, that makes sense. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't come from that particular background um, or working as a consultant with the racial justice oversight body. Um, but my personal experience with Kaiser, does, it, it doesn't surprise me um, what you said. Um, and I, I think along that line, sort of in terms of having, um, you know, an in-house social worker who uh, creates plans based on what's available in the community if folks don't qualify, I'm curious if there are any gaps uh, there, just in terms of what's available, what people can use, um, as opposed to a person who has, uh, you know, a, a, a um, a favorable sort of medical qualification? I think the individual therapy component has been really difficult. Um, finding an individual therapist who will take clients um, has been a real struggle. So we've had a few clients who live in Alameda County and our social worker is amazing and has spent hours on the phone with Alameda Behavioral Health trying to get them connected to a therapist. Um, and 
We've had no luck in Solano County with that. Um, there are a couple other counties that have robust mental health diversion programs in place, like Santa Clara and San Francisco. And we have had good outcomes where their mental health diversion treatment team will provide services to our clients and then provide reports. So I think one fix that I would love to see, and I've been talking to Department of State Hospitals about this a little bit, is the idea of funding the treatment services um, regionally, as opposed to like county by county, just in these big counties like ours, where, where people move so fluidly between counties. Thank you. That's, that's really great feedback. I mean, not that I could. <laughs> You can't fix it, but it, it's good to know. Um, you know, for the record, um, there may be some some way down the line that we can, um, you know, sort of help to move um, folks who might have those sorts of resources or be uh, interested in making themselves available in that way. To to think of it uh, in those terms. I have one last question uh, that I would ask to uh, both of our presenters. Uh, something I meant to ask individually, but it, um, you know sort of escaped me until now. And that is whether or not you all have uh, a sense or specifics in terms of racial and ethnic data as far as who is uh, admitted to these programs versus who is not, uh, who's successfully completing that sort of thing. Uh, I can jump in uh, just from the military diversion. Um, space. So I haven't been uh, collecting specific data uh, on, um, on race um, with respect to who is coming into veterans treatment court generally and more specifically uh, who is being referred for military diversion, who's being accepted into military diversion. Um, what I can say though is that despite not having the empirical data, I think the anecdotal data suggests that it tracks, you know, it, it tracks pretty closely to the data we see in the criminal court system generally, um, where uh, once again, people of color, black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by the criminal court system. So we tend to see uh, black and brown veterans coming into the criminal court system as well. Uh, and uh, I will say though that um, because the, the military population, I think skews more toward um, less black and brown people, we do see uh, more non-black and brown people coming into the Veterans Treatment Court program um, compared to, I think the population that we see in the criminal court system writ large. So uh, I think that's a long way of saying that it largely tracks what we see in the criminal court system generally, but perhaps not quite as stark. And then for mental health diversion, I actually went, I was in preparation for this, went and looked back at our 14 people that have been successfully terminated. Um, and four were Asian, four were white, four were African-American, um, one was Hispanic, Latino, and then one, I, I am not sure how um, he identifies. And so I wasn't tracking it at the beginning um, when we started, um, but that's sort of my quick snapshot. Um, and then as far as the current clientele, I would say the majority of folks are white. So I think about 14 of our 27 are white um, with a mix amongst the other 13 folks. I, I don't think, we don't seem to have as many Latino or Hispanic um, people on diversion as I have seen in my, you know, when I've done like a general felony caseload. 
Um, and I don't know, I don't know why that is. Thank you. Thank you all for those questions. Um, before we move, any more questions from the public? Well, Cheryl has her hand up. Oh, thank you. Cheryl? Yeah, because that last question just, just it, it, it's bothersome to me, it's, it's special, especially because we see the racial balance in our body. And um, thank you, Christopher, for, for that question, because um, to me, if we look at the criminal legal system, the people who we see most incarcerated are, uh, are exactly the, the the opposite of who you just said are your most common people in diversion, right? So the most people who you have in, in the diversion program right now are white individuals. Well, the most people who we see in the criminal legal system are the opposite. They're black and brown people. The most people who we see coming through um, who need mental health care, I wish Ms. Gigi was here so she can tell on this, are black and brown individuals, but somehow they're not getting the diversion programs. So I, I'm, I'm not asking you for an answer for this, but I am asking that you take a look at this and maybe get back to us on this. Why are they not getting, I, I, I find it very hard to believe that only black and brown people are the most dangerous and they're the ones who, who don't qualify and they pose the biggest threat to, to society. Um, and the judge only finds that they are the most at risk of causing society so much harm that they cannot qualify for diversion programs. I find it just incredulous. They, they're the only ones who cannot go into these programs, right? And only the white felons are okay to release back into society because their crimes, their, their felonies are, are just not the kind that they are going to pose a risk to society. It, it, it's just incredulous to me. And maybe nobody else has this issue, the data, but I do. And I find it that, and, and, it's, and it's not just this data, but the data from program to program to program, including our regular criminal justice, uh, criminal legal system data is, is proving time and time again that there's something that is working right with this broken system. Because this system keeps, incrimin keeps criminalizing black and brown bodies, and finding a way to, to not work or to work the way I should say, maybe it's working the way it's supposed to work. But uh, there's something wrong here with these numbers. Thank you so much for your information. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cheryl. And this also goes along with um, Patrice dropped a question in the, in the chat. Do you think this is attributed to the types of charges comparatively across different race or ethnic groups? I think in part, I think also um, it's like I said, that that rap sheet and what has happened historically in the person. So you could have two people who have 10 police contacts where they're symptomatic and one person goes to psych emergency eight out of 10 times and another person goes into custody 10 out of 10 times when both of them are having a mental health crisis. And then it creates this criminal rap sheet, criminal record where they're, you know, arrested for battery or assault on a police officer or various other things that happen when someone's having a mental health crisis. Um, so I think it's cumulative, um, unfortunately. And it, it's a big problem. Thank you. Thank you both Christy and Brandon um, for this very helpful information. Um, I know we're gonna go into talking about next steps, um, but this is definitely um, the information that we need. As Cheryl said, we are the racial justice of the racial justice oversight body and so this is the information that we need to figure out and identify those gaps in the system um, and how we can make those recommendations to support the people that need support 
All right. Well, we are going to move on to those next steps. Um, I know one of the next steps, because we do have some more diversion programs for adults, I believe, in the county. Um, and I think our goal is to have uh, the district attorney's office present on those particular programs. I believe that they're um, the leads for those programs. Um, yeah, and I'll just jump in really quickly and say, uh, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, our guests for your presentations. Um, and, uh, you know, even more impressively for doing that without uh, some visual aid, at least that we could see, right, that you were referring to or sort of walking us through the entire time. Um, definitely, I think the expectation um, internally, um, based on, from what I understand, some county council guidance was, um, you know, to try to lock in um, attachments. And certainly, if folks were going to be referring to attachments that they needed to be provided in advance. Um, but uh, I definitely don't think what we were trying to do and what we managed to avoid doing in this case was making people type words on paper, right, just to tell us things that they could manage to present. Um, so for that reason, um, you know, for all I know, uh, and it, this is worth saying, um, you know, DA Becton uh, may have been uh, ready and willing and able to present today, but I was under the impression that there were attachments forthcoming. So I um, uh, chose to delay that for another meeting. So if that, if I, if I was wrong in that, um, then we can definitely pick it up next meeting. But just wanted to make sure that uh, we had time to get the attachments in so that uh, nobody was sort of being uh, sternly warned after a county meeting that we better, you know, have attachments if anybody's going to be referring to them. Um, so certainly that is going to be one of the next steps is having a uh, the DA's office present on um, the the adult diversions that we, we we kind of ran down a few meetings ago. This was the the thing about the attachments was that attachments for the DA's office or attachments for the I was a little confused. I'm sorry. Well, no, I was, yeah, I was just saying that I was I was looking for them. Um, in, in the event that you needed to use uh -huh. any, right? If you were gonna be referring to something, oh. you needed to share a screen, right? For us to see so, any sort oh, of- oh, I, I, I sent mine um, right at when I got asked for them. I, I don't know, just check and see what happened to them. Okay. Yeah, I did send them. I only had one, one page really, but it did get sent. And I will, let me just check on where that went, when that went. And I, I can certainly kick to the next meeting, which is fine as well. Uh, if that's that, I'll do it. Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm checking my scent, and it looks like I don't know where it went, but it didn't go to you. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, because I definitely had a little PowerPoint. I'll send it to you now so that in preparation for the next meeting, I can make sure I'm in compliance with what you've asked for. Thanks, Dia Vector. All right. Any other um, questions or comments that are coming up for people right now? Or even sharing, is there something that we need to keep an eye on um, as we kind of move forward in this? Um, that we need to be thinking about as we discuss more about these diversion programs. No, okay. All right, so our next meeting um, will be September 16th. We'll have um, the, the other presentations from the district attorney's office on those diversion programs. Um, yeah, Colleen, um, just to your, your comment, it sounds like racial data is not being collected and should be. I think there's a lot of data that, I mean, that's been a struggle um, in the county for a long time around collecting data and um, 
part of why we have also a, a data committee to look at what's being collected, what's not being collected, and um, what gaps need to be filled in that area as well. Yeah, and I would just add really quickly, that's also one of the sort of recommendations. Uh, I think when we started this process, we were looking to make some very specific programmatic recommendations about, you know, things that have worked in other places. And there's still room for that, certainly, and we can still explore some of that. But it turns out, you know, as we as we sort of look at what we have, there are some really basic, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. you know, that are probably going to take precedence in terms of the recommendations that we're making about diversion programs and how they should operate in the county. Um, and I think along that line also, um, you know, just um, uh, thinking about, and you'll see this maybe next meeting, if not next meeting, the meeting after that, um, in terms of when we, when we look at the, uh, the diversion uh, recommendation draft again, uh, probably put something in there for folks to respond to about, um, you know, doing a thorough sort of examination of eligibility criteria through a race equity lens, right? So some of, some of what we're talking about is uh, eligibility criteria issues and how those things are defined or, or perceived, um, you know, and even, you know, recognizing that things that seem like no brainers in eligibility criteria, such as prior, um, uh, uh, law enforcement contact and things like that, right? If we can recognize that um, there are disparities in the system as it currently operates, it's it's sort of a given that those things are going to exist and create barriers for people of color, which is just going to further exacerbate the issues that we have now if we don't actually uh, think about new ways to to address those things um, or or at least to revise. Uh, eligibility criteria to to you know take into consideration those unfortunate truths and realities right so those are definitely things that are going to show up in our recommendations but it is interesting right that I think even for myself um, coming into this I thought the recommendations would be really sophisticated and some of this stuff is really basic that we need to address first before we get into more uh, um, you know, deep research-based sort of programmatic, we want this kind of program or this kind of service versus that kind of program or service recommendations. Thank you, Chris. All right, Robin, we will miss you. <laughs> and Ellen, glad to have you on the team. Thank you. Um, and with that, we are adjourned. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.